Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. Today we'll be looking at the state of human rights in the United States, measuring monitoring rights now. What we'll be doing is measuring and monitoring what matters most, because we know what we measure is what matters most. And we're very fortunate to be able to be joined with the Human Rights Measurement Initiative. And school is just starting. So I like to think of it as a report card on human rights for countries around the world. Also, by looking at this important data, we can reimagine rights in the United States. We most recently just celebrated World Indigenous Peoples Day, and I'm very honored to welcome both of our guests, Chad and Keo, to share with us a bit about human rights in the United States. Chad, can you share with us a bit about, and Keo, a bit about World Indigenous Peoples Day and Indigenous rights? And then I know we'll get into some other aspects on racism and racial justice. Uh, sure. So, I, you know, um, at, at uh, Human Rights Measurement Initiative, we um, one of the things we do is we sort of ask human rights advocates in the countries we work in around the world, who's at most risk, right, to experience human rights abuses. And um, if you look at uh, our, our data, which is publicly available on uh, rightstracker.org, um, what you'll see is that one of the groups that's most commonly selected uh, it, it, uh, pretty much, you know, across countries where where it's possible to be selected, uh, you know, is indigenous people. We see indigenous people consistently, you know, at risk for human rights violations in many countries around the world, uh, including the United States. And so, uh, particularly if you look at the economic and social rights data for the United States. Um, um, indigenous peoples are often at high risk to experience limitations on things like uh, the right to, uh, to, to food, uh, the right to a job, and, and right to health and these kinds of rights. Uh, Talia, do you have things to add there? Yeah, it's, de it, it, it's definitely a trend across the world. Um, in every country where we measure this, uh, Indigenous people are right at the top of the list of groups that our human rights experts tell us are experiencing rights violations. Um, and so that's, it's a, it features really strongly um, in certainly in, you know, in every settler colonial country that you can, you know, that you would list off the top of your head. Um, but it's, I, I looked through all the data just yesterday to refresh myself and um, Indigenous people show up strongly in, in Vietnam, in Nepal, in Malaysia. Um, it's, it's a worldwide trend that Indigenous people's rights are not being respected. Thank you so much. And we do know though that human rights is really the most important way to really look at quality of life, as you were talking about with economic, social, there briefly, Talia, and Wellington and New Zealand is actually, Aotearoa is leading the way with a new sort of well being measurement as well in budget and other aspects. So it's exciting to see the conversation around human rights being much more broad. Um, could you share a little bit about well being and some of those things going on with economic, social, cultural, since, economic, social since you started in that way? Yeah, well, I, I'd like to start by saying, um, you know, warm greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We certainly have a long way to go here. Um, so I, I wouldn't hold our, um, our settler colonial state up as an example of um, how to do things. Um, we, we are, you know, we're having some conversations and there's progress being made, but there's a long way to go. Um, so we, uh, at, at HUMI, we measure economic and social rights as well as the sort of more classic civil and political rights that some people might think of first when they think of human rights. Um, and, and we measure them um, taking into account a country's income. Um, so we know that the, the international obligation on governments um, is to do the best with what they have. So, you know, nobody expects um, a very poor country to have um, a world-class health system. Um, but, but every Every country is obliged to do its best for its people um, and to keep getting better by devoting the, the maximum available resources. So we measure how well a country is doing with what they've got. Um, and, uh, and we measure uh, the right to food, health, housing, education, and work adequate income. Um, all of those things, um, looking at how well governments are, are doing at turning their income into rights outcomes. Really good points, and we agree. Unfortunately, most settler states have so far to go, and they're really just beginning to start having the real conversations that we're looking at with reparations and other issues. And that allows us to get back to focusing a little bit on the United States as well. We also know that 
August 31st will be the 20th anniversary of the World Conference Against Racism. And when we look at civil and political rights in the US, maybe Chad, you could share with us how we're doing and what is some of the information that you found in that important work regarding civil and political rights in the United States of America? Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I, I mean, just to start with sort of a broad overview of how the United States is doing on, on civil and political rights, uh, the short answer is quite poorly. Um, if, if you just sort of limit uh, the comparison to high income democracies, right? And those, the, particularly those countries that we have data for the Human Rights Measurement Initiative. The US is the worst performer we have in the data set in that subset of, of countries, pretty much across the board on civil and political rights. Um, there just isn't another country like the United States that does as poorly on that subset of rights. Um, and that's not really unique to civil and political rights. I mean, we have a much larger data set. Uh, for economic and social rights. And even if you look at that subset of countries for economic and social rights, the United States is usually among the worst performers of high income democracies among in, in economic and social rights. So uh, pretty much across the board on human rights, perhaps unsurprisingly to, to, to viewers of your show, right? Uh, the United States doesn't do incredibly well uh, um, on those metrics. Um, now, if we think about why uh, the United States does so poorly, um, there are a number of reasons, right? We've already talked about one of them. Uh, poor treatment of indigenous peoples uh, is, you know, obviously a centuries long problem in the United States. Uh, and I think people tend to relegate that concern to the past. It's obviously still very current um, and still a, a crucial issue uh, uh, in the United States. But looking beyond that, uh, racial discrimination and racism uh, uh, are at the fore, right? Um, you know, if you sort of track through our data uh, and and once again, look at the, the people who are selected as the people at risk. One of the things you'll find is if you look across the economic and social rights, uh, people of particular races are often one of the most selected groups. And if you sort of uh, uh, dig into that a little bit more uh, about who those particular people are, 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 you know, our expert respondents that we work with that are human rights practitioners around the United States are often referring to Black people, uh, Latinx people, uh, and often sometimes, even in this category, they'll once again bring up indigenous people. And, um, you know, that sort of sets this picture of already on economic and social rights, you know, black people, Latinx people are not having their rights respected. Um, so then we maybe want to look at, well, can they use the political system? Can you use sort of the democratic system to try to get something better, right? To change that, that maldistribution and that those poor economic and social rights practices. But then what we see there is once again, uh, especially uh, people of particular races are often the most selected group as being at risk for not being able to enjoy the right to political participation, uh, are facing violations uh, of their rights to assembly and association, right? Our, our respondents last year brought up uh, the violent response to many Black Lives Matters protests, right? Um, um, the backlash against uh, last year's election that we saw and, and the many sort of voting restrictions that states around the country tried to pass in the aftermath of that election uh, on the basis of, you know, let's face it, uh, not true allegations of election fraud, um, but all of the attempts to control this, you know, sort of fictional election fraud uh, center around limiting voting rights for people who are often marginalized, often black people, often Latinx people, often poor people. Um, and so we see, you know, that that venue for changing things is cut off. Um, and at the same time, these are the very communities that are facing violence on the on the part of the state at, at high levels, right? Um, so if you look at our extrajudicial killing uh, uh, metric, uh, it's one of the lowest in the world, uh, at least for the, the, the data that we collect. Um, certainly the lowest among high income democracies. And once again, people of particular races are, you know, the most sort of targeted group there, right? And, and you know, once again, our respondents tell us they're talking about black people and Latinx people or, or the groups that are being targeted uh, by the state for things like extrajudicial killing, for torture, uh, for arbitrary arrest, right? And so it's really a picture of a country, right, where, um, both the economic and social conditions that marginalized people live in are, are, are poor and dire. The sort of uh, violence of the state is high towards those groups. 
And the mechanisms that one would go about changing that, either the institutionalized mechanisms via the vote or something like that, are cut off, and the non-institutionalized mechanisms of protest and assembly and association are met with more of that state violence. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think that this is new information to anyone, um, I, but I do think that people might find it surprising that it comes across so clearly uh, in the data that we have. I think that's probably one of the best aspects of the Human Rights Measure and Initiative is it puts it there. So it has the information, it shows what's going on. And as you brought up, uh, last November was when we also had the Universal Periodic Review of the United States when the world examines the US. And it reminded me why what you were sharing that at that time, death penalty got a lot of questions. The issue around voting got a lot of questions. All those issues came up. And it also was an aspect where you even had a, a really urgent debate taking place at the Human Rights Council, looking at systemic racism, police brutality, and even a vote at the most recent Human Rights Council saying that the US and the world has to do something about that. So it's probably a trend that you see in the US, but also across other countries. And it's, it's really great that you're able to present it that way. And the other side of looking at it is even the sad part as you brought up, once people did utilize all those civil and political rights to challenge a system that was set against and were able to win by actually electing someone that went along more with the majority of what the people saw as the right direction for the country to move away from that racist past, you now see those trends you pointed out on eliminating those rights to then make it even worse. So it, it definitely points out what we can do. Tell you, yeah, is there anything you'd like to add to that as before we move into the economic and social rights a bit more and, and looking at people at risk as well as empowerment rights and quality of life? I think our, our data for the United States really highlights that all human rights are connected um, that, and that racial injustice um, is the dominating influence um, in the human rights landscape in the US. Um, we see that um, racial uh, groups, either, um, either ethnic groups or uh, the indigenous people, uh, they're selected as the top groups. Also, you know, migrants and, and refugees and asylum seekers, um, you know, those kinds of um, things are the, are the biggest influence in terms of who is being most affected by rights violations. Um, and I'd also say that um, we, we did some extra research on the effect of the pandemic this year um, and on the, on the effect of the government responses around the world to um, the pandemic. And um, our, our data for the US had all of those same markers where uh, racial injustice affected how people experienced the pandemic. Um, and so when we saw things like the right to housing being affected with evictions, um, that was along racial lines. Uh, when we saw a lack of health care, when we saw um, deaths, uh, those were along racial lines. Uh, and and when, we, um, when we saw, um, when we think about who are the essential workers who are being most affected by being exposed to the pandemic, those fall along racial lines also. Uh, and so our commentators and our, our expert respondents uh, repeatedly said that the, the negative effects of the pandemic were disproportionately affecting communities of color. And of course, when you look at the response by the government, especially with COVID, I'm sure that even dragged the US even lower. And it might've had a small blip going back up with the new administration, but it's also really what you're talking about, economic social rights. When we don't have healthcare as a human right, when we don't have education as a human right, when we don't have the important issue of housing as a human right, as you pointed out, maybe you can explain a bit more about economic social rights, but also as you were talking about all the human rights being interconnected, Talia, and then leading over to Jen. Yeah, well, the, as I said, the way that we measure um, how well countries are doing on economic and social rights, that's the right to food and health and housing, education, um, adequate income, those kinds of things. We're looking at how well a country is doing um, compared to how it should be doing, what we calculate it should be achieving. So we look at things like um, how many kids are in school and uh, how many people have 
um, food security. And then we look at how well other countries with the same level of income as the United States are doing on those kinds of things. And what we find is that the United States is doing very badly. Um, that the scores fall into the, the very bad or bad range for almost everything. For, for one metric, they just, just scrape into our fair category. Um, and so, so that means that there is so much more that the people of the United States could, could expect to achieve, to expect to um, enjoy their human rights. Um, and, and so that means that you know, the government, successive governments, because these scores have been low for as long as we've been measuring them, successive governments are, are letting the people down. Um, now we don't tell uh, our scores don't don't tell countries how to achieve these outcomes. Um, so we, we don't mind if it's done by private market effects or by um, a, you know by a, a social welfare state. Uh, we just measure the outcomes, and what we see is that the outcomes are very bad in the United States. So um, the, the current way things are going uh, is not serving the people well. That's a really good point, and I like the way you put it in a couple of ways. One is. We all know from economic and social rights, it's achieving progressively based on all those aspects you shared. And that's a situation with such a high GDP and, and one of the largest economies should be doing so much better. And then it really remind me of, you know, states are duty bearers. They have that responsibility to their citizens. And by providing this information, human rights measurement initiative is actually giving us tools to then utilize the other human rights tools of civil and political rights to make sure that our government actually does better and upholds those rights. Chad, would you like to add a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think all the, I, Ty hit all the big points uh, um, domestically, I think incredibly well, and that, that's, I think all very true. Um, you know, I, I think it's also part of a broader, uh, you know, point to be made about the United States participation in the international human rights regime as well, right? I mean, the United States has ratified so few international human rights treaties, right? I mean, we, we ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but as you pointed out, we've signed, we haven't ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So deliberately, our government doesn't legally consider those rights human rights, right? Um, we haven't ratified uh, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. I believe one of five countries in the world that hasn't done that at last time I checked, or the only country in the world that hasn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, right? The United States, tends to talk a pretty big game on human rights in the international sphere. We talk about, you know, being like one of the world's you know, oldest democracies and how rights are at the core of, of who we are and what we do. Um, and we demand a lot of other countries in terms of their human rights practices. And I, I you know, I, I, it's hard for me not to take things a little bit towards the foreign policy angle right now, given that everybody's watching events unfold in Afghanistan right now. And um, you know, when the United States brings human rights pressure to bear on other countries, it's very easy for other countries to point out the United States' own hypocrisy, right? Um, you saw this, uh, uh, it, you know, when the United States uh, 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 delegation met with China and Alaska earlier this year. And, you know, when we bring up, you know, questions of genocide in China, questions of human rights abuse in China, questions of crackdowns in Hong Kong, you know, China's immediate response is, you know, well, you know, what about the fact that, you know, racial injustice runs rife in the United States? Uh, what about the fact that we see, you know, protests being met with violent force by United States police officers? Who are you to tell us what to do, right? And don't get me wrong, I, I, I completely recognize the whataboutism in, in that uh, approach by the Chinese delegation. But the United States' sort of unwillingness to participate fully in this human rights system not only hamstrings the U.S.'s own sort of foreign policy efforts and the things they want to do, but it just makes the entire system weaker, right? It makes it more difficult to promote better lives for people worldwide. And so, you know, when I see things like the fact that the United States hasn't embraced economic and social rights, right, and we haven't said that these things are human rights, that we have an actual debate in the United States about whether or not healthcare is a human right, right? These, these are things that not only weaken the enjoyment of rights here at home, home for me, right, uh, here in Georgia in the United States, but also everywhere else in the world where the United States would like to sort of encourage better respect for human rights. Our, our efforts are always gonna be weaker unless we deliver for, for people here. And I think that's important. And it's, it's really getting to domestic and foreign policy being one. If you wanna talk about democracy, justice, human rights, you have to understand 
it's what we do on a daily basis. And if we want to improve those daily conditions, it must be linked for liberation of all peoples. And I, I thought that was a really good point that you brought up there. The other example, of course, that, that, that is raised is, especially as we do look at what's going on with Kabul, with Afghanistan, and talking about women's rights, it's very difficult to talk about that when you haven't ratified CEDAW, as you brought up. And the other countries that haven't ratified are the countries that we give aid to from the Pacific to not ratify. And so we really do have to have that deep conversation at home. And I do believe the Human Rights Measurement Initiative is a positive tool to begin that conversation. Because then it's not what you talked about, Chad, we're bringing it up because we just want to point out something negative about your country, but we're actually all in it so that everyone's rights around the world are promoted and protected. And uh, the Universal Periodic Review is a good step forward. The problem, of course, is that it's countries reviewing other countries. So, of course, there's that, it's political. Uh, but the Human Rights Measurement Initiative is an exciting, really, a really process to involve people so that everyone can be involved to see how everyone's doing. And I like to say by being available to seeing the advocacy and activism of other places, how they've improved. Uh, maybe Tal, you could share with us a bit about Human Rights Measure and Initiative, why it's so unique and how it began, and we can continue in that path. Yeah, well, we, we believe that what gets measured gets improved. That um, that leaders like numbers, uh, so you know, uh, um, government leaders want to know the GDP figures. They want to know how many people are in employment. Um, and at the moment, you know, before we were started doing our work, they didn't have numbers on human rights. There's a lot of monitoring and reporting around the world on human rights. You know, a lot of um, fantastic people doing great work at at reporting um, particular cases, for instance, of of people who are experiencing rights violations, but what we discovered that there wasn't uh, was any numbers, um, objective measurements where you can track progress, when you, where you can compare countries um, with each other, and when you can see, um, you know, how much further each country has to go to really make sure that its people are thriving. Uh, so what we do is that we use um, peer reviewed uh, and you know in some cases award winning methodologies that are accepted both by the academic community as being you know robust kind of science and also by the practitioner community as reflecting the reality uh, we use those methodologies to produce numbers that people can present to their leaders so we want people to be able to say to their leaders well look at the scores um, and the scores are not going up and we want the leaders to call in their advisors and say well this doesn't look very good um what what do we need to do to get our scores up for next year's um round of rights tracker update um and, and there are you know there are lots of clear answers uh, you know everyone in civil society will be able to point to the top five things that need to change in any country um at, but we, we want um numbers to help drive that um prioritization we want uh, leaders to be you know have an extra incentive to care about human rights and about changing how they uh, make policy and make laws um, and treat people um, so that their scores will go up. Um, we just want to harness a bit of competitive spirit um, to, to kick off a race to the top. Um, so we, we want to um, provide useful tools for, for everybody, for the human rights community, for general citizens who can write to their elected representatives and say, did you notice that our scores are really bad? What are you going to do to get them up? Um, we want uh, to provide useful tools that will help to drive change. That's a really good example. Also looking at the most recent Olympics where everybody is watching the gold count so much. I love the analysis of looking at the score and it's forcefully football starting up in the US and Chad's right there where all the big football teams are and they care a lot about in college as high school and university and pro. Maybe it's a great way of thinking about it. like US, you love the gold for the Olympics. You care so much about how each city's doing in football each week and who they drafted. It's applying that kind of a discussion to looking at human rights in our country. So maybe Chad, we can look at that, or what are some other benefits of HRMI and how it can be a positive tool? Right. Well, so I'll I, I, I'll, I'll answer that a little bit through through my own story with with, sure. with Hermie a bit. Um, so I, I you know I'm a 
political science academic here at the University of Georgia, right? I have been trying to measure human rights through various projects uh, for the better part of 16 years now. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been involved in a lot of projects where we've, where we've tried to take this on. Uh, and we've often produced things that were neat and useful, especially for people like like you and me, Joshua. Uh, like you know, uh, uh, people who are in the academic work on this and 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 you know, trying to understand human rights. But a lot of the time, those data, those numbers, didn't really get traction in the broader world. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but ultimately, I, I think it boils down to we weren't producing data that that you know, the people who work in this field, the people who think about it on a daily basis, weren't producing data that they felt comfortable with, that they understood, that they could believe in, and that they actually thought were produced in a way that was useful uh, uh, to make change, right? Um, and no matter how hard many of us try, it's gonna be really difficult to convince every country in the world to set up sort of independent, you know, uh, human rights institutions to collect these data for us. So until that day comes where we're really that well off and we have those sort of national human rights institutions that are capable of doing this independent of government everywhere in the world, it's largely on those of us in civil society and in academia to figure out a way to produce data to hold states accountable and to do it in such a way that it's not just useful for academics and it's not just useful for people who understand the mechanics of how to produce those data, but also useful for everyone, right? I, I want to produce data that, um, you know, my family members who've never thought about this stuff before can go to, they can quickly understand and they get, get the point. They under, they, they're, they're, they're quickly able to use that in conversation. Um, and so um, one of the, I think, major strengths of Hermie is that everything we do is co-designed. Uh, we, it's not, me sitting in a room coming up with a methodology. It's not uh, 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 Susan Randolph, our economic and social rights lead, right? Thinking of this stuff or Matt Raines who runs our civil and political rights uh, thing. It's, it's, it's um, you know, all of our methodologies we work on, we take to a broader audience of human rights practitioners and journalists and academics. And we ask, what do you think about this? And we work together to produce something that we can all agree you know, reflects the reality well, uh, actually captures the concept and measures it well in the way academics think about it, but also is useful from the perspective of people who are trying to make policies or people who are trying to advocate to governments, right? Um, I, I can't say enough about how I, how important I think that co-design piece is. And, and um, to me, you know, as somebody who's worked on a lot of projects that have tried to do something like this in the past, that's the thing that really sets Hermes data apart is that we're producing something that's useful and understandable by everyone. And if it's not understandable by you yet, then we want you to tell us so we can make it understandable to you and we can actually bring it to you in a way that's usual and can and can produce change where you are. That's perfect. And that really puts it where it's most important. It must be useful for directly impacted peoples whose rights are violated. And that's the starting point. And of course, when we looked at what the US used to do with its human rights report, it, it was good that State Department did collect information, but of course it had a lot of problems because it's not just independent. And I think what's really coming up as we're close to concluding our program, as the US is running for the Human Rights Council, and there will be one event with the International Service for Human Rights and Amnesty International on September 8th or so, when the US will give their pledge and promise, I think the Hermie Initiative might be a good tool to add to that to say, these are the areas that need to be improvement and it's something that civil society can organize together using that data for then direct action and diplomacy to improve the human rights record in the United States. So as the US runs for the Human Rights Council coming up for one of those coveted 47 seats, it's much better as we pointed out to be involved, to not allow other countries moving in that would weaken it around the world even more. But when any country runs, the Hermi information is a great beginning for us all to use as a tool to transform human rights in our country. Of course, we don't have a Paris, you know, principled institution as a national human rights institution, but those are all good things that we can work towards. And I thank you both for coming up with this valuable tool and look forward to working together as we go forward to improve human rights record in the United States. And I love the point you said, Talia, if you wanted to close out, well, we measure what matters and looking at it that way.
All right. Thank you both so much. And we look forward to our next show where we'll also look at other countries in the Hermi process, looking at the Pacific in the future. Mahalo.